Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our strategic webinar on climate change on aviation. My name is Marilyn Bastin, and I'm the head of aviation sustainability in Eurocontrol. I would like to thank you for joining us today. For your information, this webinar is also broadcasted on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So during this summer, several countries in the world, including Belgium, from where I sit today, and more recently, cities like New York face terrible and extreme weather conditions such as fire, flooding, heavy rains, and powerful heat waves. In August, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has published the last report on climate change, providing new estimates of the chances of crossing the global warming level of 1.5 degrees in the next decade. So climate change is here and is here to stay. So what about the aviation sector? Like any other transport mode, like any other business, the aviation sector has to deal with the risk related to climate change. Climate change is creating operational infrastructure, business, but also safety risk on the European air traffic management. Our sector needs to understand those risks to adapt and build resilience to potential future impacts such as more frequent or powerful heat wave or storm. To support our stakeholders, Eurocontrol has commissioned Aegis in partnership with the UK Met Office to produce a study on climate change. Sorry, I lost uh, my, my headset. Uh, to publish a study on climate change risk for European aviation. This study, published last Monday on our website, quantifies future risk for the European aviation system and should help aviation stakeholders to plan and adapt for the impact of climate change on their operation. The study investigated four key areas of risk for the industry and such as the impact of changes in storm, panel, in storm patterns and intensity on flight operation, the impact of changes in wind patterns on flight operation, but also the impact of sea level rise on uh, European airport operation, and finally, the impact of climate change um, on tourism demand. The good news is that the aviation sector has already been working on this subject for many years. So in this webinar, for once, we will not discuss the decarbonization of the aviation sector, but we will explore how to build a more climate resilient aviation to face the increasing risk related to climate change. With our panelists, and thanks to your active contribution today, we will address the following question. What are the potential impact of climate change on European aviation? Which are the risks that need to be assessed to be addressed more urgently and which are more for the longer term? What are aviation stakeholders doing to prepare for those impacts? And what else can we do to prepare for climate change and to boost our industry resilience? So for this discussion, we have lined up three leading experts who will share their experience and a recommendation on climate change adaptation. They will help us to understand what aviation is already doing to adapt to the risk of climate change and what more can be done on a European but also at a global level. So it is my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Juliana Scavuzzi. She is the, the Senior Director for Sustainability, Environmental Protection and Legal Affairs at ACI World. Mrs. Scavuzzi is also the ACI Observer to the ICAO Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection, also called CAPE, and Secretary of the ACI World Environment Standing Committee. She has more than 10 years of experience in international aviation and space law and policy, of which seven have been dedicated to environmental protection. Then I would like to introduce Mr. Olaf Mosvold Larsen, who is Senior Executive Advisor for Avinor, Norway's air navigation service provider, also operating more than 40 airports in the country. He has been working for Avinor since 2007 with special responsibility for issues related to climate change and the environment, and is currently managing Avinor's carbon reduction program. Mr. Larson has also been chairing the ACI Europe's Environmental Strategy Committee. 
And finally, I would like to introduce Denise Prong, Program Manager Corporate Responsibility at Schiphol. Denise Prong has been working at Royal Schiphol Group since 2008. She is head of sustainability. She is based in the strategic department, working on embedding sustainability in the organization activities and new way of working. Contributing to a net zero carbon emission aviation sector by 2050 is one of her main priority. Denise is also an active member of ACI World and ACI Europe. So each panelist will make a five minute presentation and then I will open the floor to a question and answer session. Some of you have already sent some questions in advance and I would like to thank you for this. We will select some of them, but we would like you to shape the discussion. And to do so, you are more than welcome to enter your question in the question and answer chat. And if you encounter any technical problem, you can also use the chat function. So now I'm sure you are impatient to listen to our first panelist. So I would like to give the floor to our first guest, Juliana Scavuzzi. So please, Juliana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marilyn, uh, for the kind introduction. And let me thank Eurocontrol also for the invitation and for this initiative. And of course, congratulate you with the recent publication, uh, which is very important for the industry. And we keep our head waiting for those publications from Eurocontrol on the topic. Uh, thank you very much. So I'll quickly just share my screen um, so you can see my presentation. And I will try to be uh, very brief as and, and comply with my five minutes time. So I will start uh, just saying that this is indeed a topic that we have been working as a sector for, for quite a long time. Uh, our first uh, paper uh, was done at, at ACI, I think more than a decade ago. More recently, we have passed a resolution in 2018, uh, encouraging uh, member airports to take action on the topic, but also conducting risk assessments and uh, incorporate those uh, actions accordingly at a very early stage and, and considering their overall business continuity, also their emergency plans, and of course their master plans. Also considering the uh, developing a communications uh, stakeholder uh, engagement as well. Uh, later in the same year, we, we published this uh, policy brief with similar recommendations, but it also contains some case studies and the matrix of climate stressors and examples of airports that have already developed uh, uh, adaptation plans. We did a survey uh, recently in 2019 and 2020. I will speak more about that in my next slide. And just to highlight a survey we did for the finance uh, community last year that just showed the relevance of sustainability criteria that to inform their uh, investment decisions. 70% of the uh, respondents said that they already use and 50 said that they expect that to increase. And of course, that includes uh, climate related uh, risks uh, reporting and climate action. So we've seen this trend to increase not only uh, from uh, regulators and from countries, but also from uh, voluntary initiatives such as the Task Force on uh, Climate-Related Disclosure of Finance uh, Climate Risks. And um, uh, we also have two other publications that uh, support airports in terms of their uh, recovery from uh, disasters and emergencies, including climate change. One, which is on um, uh, business continuity and another one on emergency plans. And here, the survey that I mentioned, just a snapshot of uh, two points uh, relevant. Uh, we asked the membership if they have been impacted by adverse weather events and patterns. And uh, we're surprised to see that almost 70% of you know, members of all regions that have responded have been impacted. While we see a uh, last number, for instance, in Europe, 53 is still significant. We see this uh, massive number of almost 90% in the Asia Pacific region. We also asked if they have conducted the risk assessment. 40% of the all regions said they have already conducted of the respondents, 20 were planning to do, while another, uh, the, re the remaining 40 have have not done yet. And an important thing to do is that uh, the respondents also, 40% of those said that they needed some sort of assistance and capacity building. And although we saw the, the highest numbers on the request from Africa, 70% uh, in Latin America, 60, we still saw relevant numbers from regions like uh, Asia Pacific, 45%, North America, 35, and even Europe, 30%. 
And uh, I would just like to bring maybe a, a, a challenge to the concept of uh, resilience. I think this new paradigm of resilience that we call, and that is a consequence direct of uh, the, the impact we, we are living from uh, the COVID crisis that have really challenged our understanding. So airports uh, and infrastructure, we, we know that they all remain available and possible to be used, but we didn't have passengers or we didn't have either, we, did, we had flights. And as a global sectors, the network dependence only increases, right? And it goes beyond local impacts due to the knock-on effects uh, from one place or one stakeholder to the other. What we call uh, the network of resilience approach is really about this uh, understanding that our resilience does depend on the resilience and support from this network and the ability of the public to travel. And we can and should leverage knowledge from other sectors and lessons learned from, from the pandemic. For example, uh, the disaster uh, management community do use uh, this network of support to manage disasters. There are several examples out there. And we need to increase uh, also uh, preparedness and business continuity at the earliest moment possible, leveraging that kind of knowledge and experience and sharing uh, practice. And as we recover, of course, we're also facing a recession and the crisis uh, of this sector uh, will also impact our ability and financial resilience. So it's essential to enable uh, overall resilience that we also look into that. And as I mentioned, the reporting on finance risks and you know, ensuring that you get uh, finance support will also be linked to also reporting on your climate-related risks and your actions towards that. Uh, and I, I like to mention that before we used to separate adaptation uh, from mitigation activities, I think more and more it became um, more uh, visible that we need to find opportunities to combine those, especially because uh, if we're investing in uh, mitigation activities, for instance, renewable energy on site and airport, we need to make sure that they remain resilient to more adverse weather. But at the same time, uh, for instance, uh, if uh, nature does not contribute to the amount we needed at some time uh, during the year, we need to make sure that we're able to save and store that kind of energy and use that after. So combining those two is it's really a resilience uh, uh, measure, I would say. And we also need to redefine our risks uh, because we need to take those from an holistic approach, considering those risks jointly, and also recognize that our resilience depend on the resilience of all and uh, this is a clear lesson learned from the COVID. Resilience uh, is proposed here as a systematic approach where people are put first, being them public, passengers, staff, but also local, regional, and global supply chains ensure continuity during disruptions. And airport infrastructure and operations are planned uh, and designed to operate uh, more resilient, as uh, we're going to be seeing in other uh, presentations and during the discussions uh, that we have today. And of course, we need time, timely action and we need the support from the appropriate policy assistance, capacity building and uh, collaboration, which is extremely relevant. And, and that's what we're doing here today, collaborating to share knowledge. And with that, I'll just thank uh, and I'll pass back to you, Marilyn, and looking forward to the questions. Yeah, thank you, Juliana, for this very interesting presentation. You gave a very good overview about the climate change adaptation from a global perspective. And it's also good to see the figures that many stakeholders are already working on it and are already uh, doing a climate change risk assessment. Uh, so this is really good news. And then I would like to give the floor to Olaf, please. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marilyn. And um, picking up on some of uh, Juliana's uh, points, I'd like to give you some sort of uh, experiences we have in uh, have had in uh, Norway over the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, we are a country which is uh, quite exposed, actually, to to the climate that is changing. We have a long, rugged coastline. Uh, 20 of our airports are very exposed, I would say, along the coast, not necessarily in terms of sea level rise, but in, in storms and storm surges, uh, etc. And I think we're also a nation where we're quite aware of the weather because we're so dependent on the weather for our operations uh, as, as an airport operator and air navigation service provider. So we actually started working on climate adaptation already in 2001 uh, in conjunction with uh, what is called a Sort of national um, white paper delivered to the to the to the parliament. It's called the National Transport Plan, 
so together with uh, road rail and and uh, and coast directorates uh, we did our first sort of climate adaptation uh, report back then and over the years we've uh, carried out quite a few uh, risk reducing measures and uh, and initiatives and investments we have integrated uh, some of these uh, uh, things into our plans and and produce and uh, and procedures but I think this is, you know, this is a uh, a topic that is all already evolving, and we get more and more knowledge and uh, of what will happen, and also gain more and more experience. So we will continue to um, to improve and, and and work on our climate adaptation uh, activities. Um, an example is that we are, as we speak, uh, carrying out uh, a revision of a risk assessment we made in in 2014. And that has been actually extremely interesting for us to get an outside view of our operations uh, and what we can do to reduce the, the, the risks uh, related to climate adaptation. I will in this presentation give you a few examples of sort of the main challenges uh, we have in, uh, in, on our latitudes. Uh, it will be a warmer, wetter and wilder climate in the future. And, but there's a big difference uh, between the more northernmost uh, airports and the southernmost airports in our long stretched uh, country. Uh, so, so they will be affected differently. And we do this, of course, safety is paramount. We do this to, uh, to reduce risks. Uh, we do it to avoid delays and disruption. And also if you start planning early enough, you can save on future, uh, future costs. So here are a few examples of what is happening when the climate gets warmer. At Svalbard Airport, the most northernmost airport, uh, the, the permafrost is melting. So we have settling, settling damages on runways and buildings. It is creating quite a lot of challenges, actually. And uh, on, mainland, on the mainland and on many other airports, um, the warmer weather increases the amount of uh, sort of freeze-thaw, the, uh, the uh, temperatures around the zero degrees when it's... Uh, melting and, and freezing and that is also challenging for us because we have to more, use more runway de de-icing chemicals which is expensive obviously but it, it also gives us issues with the environmental permits so that's a very operational side of it uh, in terms of wetter we see more freak rains uh, we see uh, rivers uh, flooding some of the airports uh, we see issues with uh, navigational equipment etc so drainage systems and uh, making sure that uh, uh, that the drainage of both the runways and taxiways and the buildings are, are appropriate is, is very important for us. And you should not also forget surface access. It doesn't really help to have an operating airport if you can't get there. And then we see this, these sort of pictures. This is a photo from, uh, from a heliport of, our, of ours out on an island in the, in, on the, in the ocean. It was, it was more or less washed away by a storm some years ago. So we've been working on wave protection and storm defenses on many of our low-lying coastal airports. And we're also implementing new design and, and maintenance requirements for, for both buildings and runways and navigational aids so they can withstand more frequent and, 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 and future storms. So to sum up this uh, five minute introduction, I would just like to reiterate what uh, Marilyn just said, that uh, the climate is changing and it will affect airports and NSPs all over the world uh, and differently, de depending on the region you're in. I mean, as I said, the, the airports in Norway are, are affected differently. And all our infrastructure will be there in the, new, in the new climate. The stuff we have and the stuff we're building will be there 20, 30 years from now. So be wise. Uh, carry out the risk assessments, integrate climate adaptation in the design phase of, of, of the infrastructure um, projects, and that can save on, on, on future resources. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf, uh, for this amazing presentation. I, I think you gave very concrete example about the impact of climate change on our operation, and you also gave very concrete example about how to adapt to those problems, you know. And also I think that carrying out uh, a climate change risk assessment is clearly a first essential step 
to reduce cost. And I think that it's also one thing which is really important for all stakeholders. Investing now could help to reduce cost in the future, because when we have to deal with the impact of climate change, it could be, uh, of course, more expensive than trying to adapt to those risks before it happens. So I think it's a, it's a really good message. So thank you, Olaf, for this. And then, uh, Denise, um, I would like to, to give you the floor. Thank you, Marilyn, and thank you for organizing this important webinar uh, and congratulations with, your, with the new report on climate adaptation, because yeah, mitigation is so much, um, has so much the attention right now, that's also important to not, not forget the climate uh, adaptation measures. Uh, okay, some perspective from uh, from the Netherlands. Um, so this is how we uh, welcome uh, our passengers upon arrival at Schiphol Airport in, in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, the Dutch have, of course, a rich history with uh, with water and especially uh, and are especially advanced in protecting uh, people and la land from flooding. And uh, yeah, that's also because half of the country is below sea level. Um, so the first time that I saw this billboard in our terminal, I, I re realized that we are actually more proud to be located below sea level than scared of it. So a little bit about uh, Schiphol Airport. It's one of the largest airports uh, in, in Europe, but it's also one of the uh, lowest located airports in the world. It's located four and a half meter below sea level. Um, it's a critical piece of infrastructure in, in Europe. Uh, and um, yeah, since mobility connects people and cities, it's important that airports are safe havens uh, to supply goods, to supply uh, humanitarian or emergency services. So uh, therefore it's crucial to, to, at the one hand, decarbonize aviation um, and protect benefits of global travel and trade. And, um, and therefore airports have, have to be resilient uh, to future changes. So Royal Schiphol Group has set ambitious goals to, to really contribute to, to the net zero carbon uh, emissions 2050 target for the aviation sector, and also uh, yeah, to become a resilient airport itself. And as climate change continues to evolve, we see more extreme weather events, the intensity changes, the frequency changes. Uh, and that makes flight disruptions and cancellations more likely. So it really, climate change is already uh, impacting on airport operations. And that's why we should take uh, climate adaptation into account. For example, during uh, thunderstorms, it's not uh, allowed to, to handle aircraft at air site. So that immediately lay, uh, leads to delays uh, in the airport processes. Um, so uh, in the Netherlands, uh, climate change uh, will affect the weather um, uh, circumstances. We, we expect that the prevailing wind direction will shift from southwest to west. We expect more extreme uh, rainfall events. And we also see uh, a more heat island effects, uh, as you can probably see at the right uh, side of the slide. Um, the urban areas, like uh, the air also the airports, are much, uh, the temperatures there are much higher than in, uh, in the areas around these urban areas. So that's something uh, we have to, to deal with. So I would like to give some practical uh, examples and challenges from, uh, from our airport. So um, yeah, for our airport, it's obviously, it's obvious to work on adaptation measures because if we don't do so, uh, yeah, we have to temporarily stop our airport operations. And yeah, that's even more expensive than uh, invest in adaptation measures upfront. Um, and Schiphol is located uh, in a polder, so that means that, that the location was previously, yeah, years ago, it was a lake. And therefore, uh, yeah, we have to prevent that the water uh, doesn't run off immediately uh, into, the, um, into the water around the airport. We have to properly manage the, the local water levels with pumps and uh, yeah, the, 
uh, back in the day where this windmills, of course. Um, and we also encountered the situation that, that during the summers in the previous years, we had some heat waves and then the fire brigade had to uh, spray water at some uh, locations at the, air, uh, at the runway system to prevent the runway system from melting. So that's really already happening today and it's really impacting the, um, the airport uh, operations uh, already. It's not something uh, from what will happen in the future. So um, yeah, how, what's our workaround? How do we handle all these changes? I think, uh, yeah, we try to really integrate uh, sustainability in everything we do in our spatial designing, for example, but also, um, yeah, we try to take it to, into account um, from, from the beginning of the project. So for example, we design buildings with green roofs um, that they can really um, uh, to, to keep the to keep the rainwater, um, and and so so we have some some spe some uh, several items that we uh, with that we integrate in our way of working. So it's not anything special anymore for for us. And one of the projects that we try to uh, do is that we uh, we had to we have to develop um, a resilient water drainage system. So when we try when we extended our uh, uniform platform, that's for wide body aircraft. Um, yeah, the local water regulations uh, was that we should build uh, a ditch or a pond. But yeah, that that led to to spatial uh, challenges. So therefore, uh, the project team. Uh, try to tackle this issue uh, in a in a more creative way, and they came up with with a very innovative water drainage system uh, below the uniform platform. So that really helps to uh, to handle this uh, extreme rainwater uh, fall, but also to keep the operations uh, going. So that's really uh, a win-win situation, and we have installed uh, sensors so that we can really monitor the water level uh, below this uh, uniform platform. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that I uh, have given uh, um, some ideas of how the climate uh, change affect the airport operations, but it also affect the aviation operations. So uh, hill storms lead to damage to the aircraft, but the higher temperatures lead also uh, to that it's too difficult too hot for planes to take off so you need uh, longer runways for example uh, another one is the changes in jet streams um, so if you fly from the us to europe you will get there quicker but if you fly from U europe to to uh, the us um, it will take more time and not even it will take more time it will also cost more kerosene to get there. And that's also <laughs> challenging because we want to get uh, to realize this net zero carbon aviation sector. So therefore it's really yeah, important that we, that we see all those, uh, the impact of the climate adaptation in our, on our processes. And it's also affecting tourism. Some bit the sport areas are too warm some summer destinations are also too warm, be, be becoming too hot for people to go to go there on holiday. So it has a really a big, big impact on the whole system. And hurricanes in, in South America, sometimes they, they seem to be very far away, but then they are really affecting the airport, the aviation network since uh, a flight from, from South America goes to uh, Atlanta, for example, and from Atlanta to Amsterdam. And then, yeah, it, the whole system is, is disrupted. So it's really uh, a big issue. And I'm, therefore, I'm very happy uh, with this webinar and with this uh, recent uh, publication of Eurocontrol to, to keep um, this topic high on the agenda. So to, to sum up for Schiphol Group, uh, we want to update our climate adaptation plan. We, we made some analysis back in 2014. Um, so we want to update that one. We want to formulate more uh, requirements that we can uh, add to projects. Um, also for the European uh, people in the webinar, 
the European uh, taxonomy is also very important that we have to uh, explain what the amount of money we invest in climate mitigation and climate adaptation uh, investments. So uh, that's very new. It's also, yeah, we're learning by doing, but I think it's a, that's a very important uh, uh, development from the European Commission. And um, the last one is that we are a member of the Global Adaptation Center. And uh, yeah, that's that's one way for us to, to build, uh, uh, to enlarge our uh, knowledge about this topic. So, uh, Marilyn, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Denise. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. I think you gave a, a, a perfect overview about what could be done, you know, on uh, airport level. And it's also good to emphasize the fact that it's not only airport infrastructure, but it's also about the operation that could be impacted by the impact of climate change and, and to emphasize the need you know, to be prepared to this. So thank you very much for the three presentation and thank you to our three panelists. And now I would like to start the question and answer session. So as I have mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you can use the question and answer uh, chat, you know, to, to put your question. Um, I have just a small message for the, the team behind the screen. Um, if there are some messages in the chat box, I don't see them, by the way. Uh, I have only access to the, the question in the question and answer chat. So just a technical issue. Uh, now, regarding the question, because we have uh, selected some questions that have been sent in advance, and I see already some questions that are coming up uh, in the chat, so I'm going to try to answer to, to most of the questions. At least we will try with the panelists to answer to all of these questions. And I see that there are some similarities with the questions that we have received and some of them that have been uh, asked already. So maybe I will start with one for Olav uh, about, um, so it, it has been sent by Thierry. Uh, this is the question, will impact of climate change on aviation and further congestion in the European airspace? Uh, sorry, will impact of climate change on aviation add further congestion in the European airspace? What is your opinion on this? Because it's something that I see in the comments, you know, that there are some concern about, about congestion that could be uh, uh, more than before because of climate change. Mm. Well, thank you. That's. Um very good and important question and i think it, it also provides an excellent opportunity to promote the, and i'm not paid to say this i do this for free <laughs> the, um, uh, the the euro control um, climate change study that was just uh, released because uh, that study actually touches upon this and I, I i think it's fair to say that we are hit more often by weather events uh, today than some decades ago, and these are causing delays and disruptions throughout the network. Um, and I think it's also important to emphasize here that these uh, delays and disruptions in one airport or one region have knock-on effects on the whole whole network. Um, and uh, you know we are sort of used to dealing with it, but it is causing trouble for us, obviously. Uh, but in the in the long run, uh, it's uh, that the, we will have to get used to this. Uh, and we'll have to get used to this uh, new climate and that will evolve and, and develop. And, we, and I think we must and will find ways to, uh, to adapt. But uh, yes, for sure, uh, climate change, uh, I think, will impact uh, the European airspace and, and may cause uh, more, more congestion if we're not clever about trying to reduce those risks and, and, uh, and, and mitigate them. Yeah, this is exactly the message. Uh, it's why we need to adapt. It's why we need to better understand those risks and, and, and we need to take some, some action about it. Thank you, Olaf. And then I would like to ask a question from, from Boeing, uh, Patrick, who asks, how do you see the impact of climate change impacting passenger cargo loads and revenues over the coming decades? So in short, how will this impact airline profits? So maybe a question for Juliana here. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Thank you, Marilyn, and thank you for the question. Another uh, very good one, not uh, very easy to, to answer, but uh, 
overall, I would say that uh, there are business risks, right, uh, that are related to the to a changing climate. We have heard about the delays, additional uh, congestion, cancellations, disruptions. They are costly. From an airport's perspective, we don't haven't we haven't uh, had this this figure in terms of amount. But I know that IATA has done uh, some exercise to try to quantify those, and uh, it seems that the last uh, the hurricane that happened uh, in 2012, uh, it was estimated in damage in almost like 0.5 billion US dollars for for that and they also estimated uh, 450 million us dollars for the impacts of a cold uh stream that happened in the us uh around the same time i think was in 2014. so i think overall uh we know that there are those risks we have seen in, in denise presentation the example in phoenix where we have this uh, illustrative real case where uh, aircraft cannot take off and they have to limit their uh, payload. And of course, airports and, and airlines revenue are also based and, and dependent on passenger numbers, cargo numbers and, and traffic. So it's inevitable that that will have an impact. So it's it's very uh, relevant to point that and, and start to consider what are the actions uh, you know that uh, we need to take in terms of resilience, not only in terms of the operational aspects, are we going to be looking to scheduling uh, flights at the times they're less hot and how that will impact you know the the network and 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 the time slots that we have available at the airport and the capacities that we have we're going to have to consider even maybe uh would that be less costly to invest in more uh resistant uh, aircraft are able to fly at higher and take off at you know at more extreme uh weather temperatures we, we don't know and and i i guess that's very important to realize that we need to start thinking about those uh those answers yeah, thank you, Juliana. Uh, looking to the chat and looking to the question before, there are many questions about mitigation and adaptation. So I would like to ask a question to, to Denise because you touched upon a little bit this subject during your presentation, but does net zero action impact the resilience adaptation plan for airports? So how to, to deal with the, the two sides of the issue in short? Yeah, yeah, indeed. That's a, that's a very good question. And yeah, for us, um, it's one topic: sustainability. So in our roadmap, we have uh, we have enclosed actions to to mitigation and uh, to to lower uh, the climate impact, but also to adapt to climate change. So for us, it's not an or or, but an end and uh, activity that we should do. And of course, uh, if we um, if we are successful in uh, reaching the the net zero carbon 2050 targets, and and I I believe we will, uh, then it will have uh, of course a positive impact on on climate change and therefore adaptation. So uh, yeah, I, I would strongly recommend to work on uh, on both items. Okay, thank you, Denise. And um, I see also many questions about the template, you know, for climate change risk uh, assessment. So maybe here a question for um, Olaf about who uh, is in charge, in fact, for the climate change risk assessment? Where can we find some template, you know, to build this paper? Because apparently you already did it, you know, uh, within Avinor. So how did you do it? Hmm. Um, well, back in the days uh, when we started working on this, that was even before my time uh, with Avino, so it's more than 15 years ago. <clears throat> it was basically like a long-term strategic um, topic. Uh, and then later on, it was moved sort of to the people working on, on carbon issues, uh, the carbon department, which involved um, me. And I still keep working on it because it's, so closely related to the new requirements in the EU taxonomy and the TCFD, etc. So climate risk is, you know, getting on top of the agenda. But we also have, um, uh, I have a very good colleague working in on our in our division for infrastructure and technology that is serving all our 43 airports. So he and his team is uh, working to sort of streamline our uh, our efforts, um, etc. Is in this regard, and he's also now responsible. Uh, for the revised assess risk assessment we're carrying out. So when we did our risk assessment uh, back in 2000, and I think we started working on it in 2013, 
that was the year after uh, Nat uh, and Heathrow had done uh, similar um, risk assessments in the UK. So we, we took sort of a simplified version of, of, the, of, of, of theirs because we have so many more, more airports to, uh, to deal with. So it would be a quite comprehensive document if we had to do the same uh, on, on all our 40, in those days, 46 airports. Um, but it's like, I think in, in, in general, it's uh, the best way to do it is to, um, to discuss with sort of the risk assessment people in your company. So you don't have like a very peculiar or different uh, methodology for risk assessment for, for climate adaptation compared to other uh, risk assessments. And it's uh, basically like a red, uh, yellow, green, you know, <laughs> three by three uh, table uh, with the high, low and medium risks. And then it's plans for, for, for mitigating them, etc. And then you also have to discuss what kind of uh, carbon, uh, weather variables will be put into it. Uh, is it temperature, rainfall, fog? Uh, you know, it's all those, uh, all those questions. And uh, the literature on climate adaptation in aviation and also risk assessment is, is steadily growing. So you'll find on the internet good examples. Eurocontrol has published something. ACI has published. Uh, it's been mentioned in the, uh, several of the ICAO environmental reports of the last decade. So it is information out there. But I think that it, the most wise thing to do is sort of team up with the risk assessment people in your organization and do it sort of try to use the same methodology because then it's easier to communicate broadly internally. And that is what's, uh, what matters, I think. Thank you, Olaf. Uh, I see another question from Jarlat Molloy from, from Nets. How do we ensure the industry takes a consistent approach to understanding the risk and impact from climate change? For example, do we need improved coordination on which climate change scenario to use in our analysis? And I would like maybe to give the floor to Juliana with maybe the ACI perspective on this. How could we improve this uh, co coordination, you know, between all stakeholders. Do you have a view on this? Sure, Marilyn, that's a very good question. I guess uh, we don't have another option. We have to. And uh, our sector has always been collaborating, you know, to uh, address our challenges. And uh, we, we can improve by having this perspective that goes a bit beyond just the local issue. It is a local issue because you need to address, you know, the, the localities of, of the, the, the challenge you have with climate change. But you also have to have this broader perspective at the global level. We have seen in the pandemic uh, the, the the challenge we're facing just because we have different approaches, not harmonized, and we have seen different countries uh, having different restrictions. So it's a sector that we are dependent on that harmonization. And uh, we are, well, we need to work together. We need to uh, increase our stakeholder collaboration. This kind of event that is happening here today is, is a, a great example of how we can, you know, uh, share experience, but uh, continue developing the body of knowledge we have uh, through IKU as well. I CIKO has this um, uh, great mandate because it has all aviation stakeholders there working together so we can have that perspective and they are doing work on resilience uh, and adaptation. So we need to make sure that we push uh, that uh, uh, agenda and collaboration that goes beyond just uh, uh, our own activities. It's, it's, it's a need. Thank you, Juliana. Um, I have a question for Denise from Sarah from Fly, uh, Fly Green Alliance. Uh, Denise, could you mention how you think EU taxonomy changes will benefit the sustainability of airports and airlines going forward? Can you discuss what is Skipper working on in this area to develop this work? Yeah, okay, uh, good question. So first of all, it starts with your own strategy for an airport and airline. You, you first have to think, what, you know, what do you want to achieve? What measures you need to get there? And I think this EU, EU taxonomy can help. And, and it's, yeah, for us, it's more like a mirror because it gives insights in how much money we spend on climate mitigation and climate adaptation. And then, yeah, you, you can see, okay, is that enough or should we spend more uh, depending on what your goals are and your measures, et cetera, and your other uh, uh, topics you focus on. So um, it's not the EU taxonomy is not a goal, uh, but a measure to help you to, 
to realize your ambitions. So I think, yeah, that, that would be my first reaction. Thank you, Denise. And I have another question for you, maybe, maybe more simple, maybe not. How do you counter too high temperature for takeoff? Longer runway, anything else? Because you mentioned this, you know, in your presentation. Yeah, so yeah. it's why you are. <laughs> so it's not the case in uh, in the Netherlands uh, yet, uh, luckily, but it is in in uh, in the Middle East and uh, sometimes in the, in Arizona, for example, in the, in the U.S. And then indeed, uh, longer runways help. Uh, and another solution is to uh, to take off some weight from the aircraft or to or to use. Um, yeah, a lot more lighter uh, aircraft, and that makes it more easier to take off because because of this higher temperature, the, the air becomes really thin, and that makes it difficult to to take off. Uh, thank you, Denise. I have maybe a question for Juliana. Uh, how does ACI plan to support the member to address the adaptation resilience challenge? What is ACI policy on resilience and adaptation? Uh, you already touched upon a little bit during your presentation, but maybe you could elaborate uh, a little yeah, bit yes. more. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Um, well, uh, on the policy we have shared in the presentation, just a brief summary, really encouraging the conduction of uh, risk assessment and that uh, implementation to our port's overall business uh, strategy, planning, master plans, uh, as part of that uh, risk assessment, also developing these stakeholder communications and collaboration uh, plans, because uh, that's relevant as well to identify with whom you should be talking to. And uh, in terms of actions, we plan to continue developing the knowledge, right, uh, that we have done. We have a series of publications, but also continue to raise awareness, uh, supporting our uh, members and also our partners. Our, uh, we're doing this here today, and, and we'd like to have more of those kind of uh, initiatives where we can have uh, that. As I mentioned, I care work, we, uh, it's a priority for us. We continue to support this activity uh, at IKEO, Resilience and Adaptation Workstream there. And uh, in, in my presentation also mentioned the need for assistance and capacity building. So we're using the, re the results of the survey to kind of define our specific actions. And uh, we have seen already some actions in Asia Pacific and Latin America to respond to, to that need. We have created a dedicated task force on those regions to work specifically on, on that topic. And of course, we plan to do a follow-up of the survey and um, hope we can continue learning from, from others on different uh, experiences. Thank okay. Th thank you, Juliana. And uh, maybe um, a question for Olaf here. How can we identify opportunities to combine mitigation and adaptation measure? Denise has already covered some part of it earlier. Do you have something else to add about uh, this, uh, this topic or maybe also to make a difference between short, mid and long term planning action? <laughs> Well, I, I think Denise touched upon some of the, the, the major points here, and is that we, 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 we can't do either or, we have to do, um, uh, we have to do both. Uh, so I think maybe one, one takeaway could be that for sort of every new build or every maintenance project, uh, one should cons consider both mitigation and adaptation in terms of drainage, building materials, whatever you know is, is in there. So, so try to start by trying to get those considerations into the procedures of, uh, of, of projects and project management and, and, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff, because the infrastructure we have already and the inf that we are maintaining and the infrastructure that we are creating, it has to sort of, what is said in English, is stand the test of time, both in terms of robustness and, and resilience, but also in terms of, uh, of low carbon impact in, in terms of, uh, of emissions, both direct emissions from the uh, buildings and whatever by itself, but also from the materials used uh, to, uh, to do the maintenance work or to create those new uh, pieces of infrastructure. So yeah. I think that's maybe uh, a, like a politician answer to the, to, to, <laughs> to the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Olaf. I have uh, another question from Paul Adamson. 
Um, should aviation's climate risk mitigations be taken in isolation or be part of a statewide action plan? For example, in the Netherlands, is action coordinated with the very important maritime and land transport sector? So maybe this question is, is more for, for Denise here. What do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think it's a difficult question. Um, yeah, sure, it should be uh, coordinated, uh, and especially in the Netherlands when the country is so, so small. Uh, but still, everyone has its every organization has its own responsibility to act in the right way. So. Um, yeah, I, I would say that that you cannot wait for others to to handle uh, to act. You should act first, and then see if you can uh, can make a, a coalition with other uh, important organizations to build upon. Yeah, thank you, Denise. Um, I have another question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, it is really important to make an early assessment of the climate change effect on the aviation to become more resilient. Are the climate models sufficiently accurate to support the analysis of the climate risk and to support the implementation of possible solutions? I think this is really a, a relevant question here. Uh, I don't know who would like to answer to this. Maybe Juliana, because I see you smiling. So maybe it was such a good idea, maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Maylene. Now, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm not an expert, but uh, we have seen so many risk assessments being developed and adaptation plans implemented. So I do believe that the methodology that exists, uh, it is sufficient uh, to, to address. Of course, when you, you define your timeline, uh, it also has an impact on the type of uh, adverse weather that you'll be dealing with if it's 50 years, if it's 100 years, uh, that will have an impact. But I do believe the methodology, I haven't heard anything uh, against or, or saying that uh, it's, it's not enough uh, or not sufficient. Yeah, and if, if I may to complement on this, because in our Eurocontrol study, we have only published a summary report, but we will publish in a few days the detailed uh, annex um, which include a lot of information about the model that have been used and so on. So, of course, the model can be uh, improved over time and will be improved over time because climate change is here, is changing. And so we need to take into account uh, the last scientific study. But I think that based on the model that already exists, the kind of information that uh, we are able to provide in this study and the annexes that will be published next week, uh, you should to find already a lot of information that could help you uh, to take some, some action at least and, and to do this uh, climate change risk uh, assessment. So I'm looking uh, for another question now. And Marilyn, uh, if I can, yeah. can build upon that, uh, because Asia World has also um, published this um, risk assessment a couple of years ago. I, I believe the policy paper was published in 2018, and that one is really helpful uh, as a start for airports to to see what the, how yeah what they can do and what they should take into account. So yeah, I would really recommend to uh, to use that policy paper as well. Yeah. Um, if if I may, Marilyn, I'd like to chip of in course. on that one as well. Uh, I, I think there is sufficient amount of information out there to start working on this, but then. It's, it's allowed to sort of do some independent thinking as well and look at your airport and look at the surface access to the airport, the electricity supply, telecommunications, everything that sort of surrounds the airport that we are dependent on. Uh, I can give you one maybe it's a little bit strange uh, example, but um, when we were creating some storm defenses at, at several of our airports up north in Norway in, some, uh, in 2012, 2013, I think, uh, because of the changing wind directions, etc., cetera, uh, and, and storm surges, the, <laughs> the project team had to map the underwater topography to try to forecast how would those new waves and how will this affect the, the safety areas around the runways. So that was a little bit of the thinking that was not sort of written in the, in the national um, uh, climate or weather forecasts, put it like that. But uh, it's like there is enough information to, to, to out there to start working on it. And then you do some thinking uh, as well. And then I'm sure it will be a good result. And 
starting thinking about this is also an extremely part of the process to get everyone involved. Uh, that's also very important, I think, to keep in mind. Yeah, indeed. And maybe because we are close to the end now, um, I, I will take just a last question because we didn't discuss this at all. We spoke a lot about the infrastructure, the operation and so on, but there is a remark in the chat about think about all the workers on the runway in weather with more than 40 degrees. So what do we do for uh, from a human perspective, you know, for the workers to tackle this? Uh, are you aware of some special treatment or adaptation that are taken to help, you know, the, the, the worker uh, on, on the airport to deal also with this extreme weather condition and heat wave, for instance? Um, uh, um, I think, well, even in, in, in Norway, even in Oslo, we had some really hot days, so the, the firefighter team were, were called out to... Um, to water the, the tarmac, uh, to cool it down with just like fresh water. So that's uh, that's helpful, I guess. But uh, I don't know, except for that, the, the heat can be challenging. Yes, indeed. And J Juliana, maybe, do you have some feedback from your stakeholder about how to tackle with this more, you know, human dimension on, on, on the problem? I have heard about the issue, uh, but I don't have, unfortunately, an example on, on how they are addressing that. But yes, uh, it, it can become, as, as Olaf says, and a uh, challenge for, for the human side as well. Yeah, indeed. So thank you very much. I, I think because the time is running fast that it's time to, to wrap up this uh, webinar. But before concluding it, I would like to give the floor for a final word to our three panelists for their main takeaway from this session, or maybe just to, to give their last final message uh, that they would like to, to convey. So I will start maybe with Juliana, please. Thank you, Marilyn, and just uh, thanks again for, for the opportunity and for this great initiative. Well, I would say uh, start local, but uh, consider you know the regional and the global impacts of uh, the issue make sure that uh, in the short term, the first thing you have to do is really start looking to your risk assessment. And uh, this is a, a very important issue. It's not only about a, a, a single weather event, there is a major, but also there are continuous impact that we're seeing, for instance, erosion, for example, that airports have to deal as well. And uh, you don't see, it's not visible, but it's happening continuously due to, to a change in climate. So uh, be bold, uh, do not wait to take action. And uh, of course, we're also committed to climate action beyond uh, resilience and, and, and climate change. We're just talking, discussing today more about that aspect. But uh, there is plenty to do, and uh, we hope to continue collaborating uh, with everyone on that end. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Olaf, please. Um, I think it's something uh, along the same lines is uh, to be rational about this. It's like panic is not an option. Uh, gather the information needed, carry out the risk assessment, see how that goes, and uh, keep it sort of core in the, in the company or at the at the airport and make sure that the report is not uh, put in the drawer and, le and left there. Uh, so carry out the ris risk assessment. And, and I think it's also important to keep in mind, and I think it's been said already in this session that, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't really help to have one airport operating if you can't fly anywhere. So we're part of a network um, and uh, creating what we said, creating islands of resilience in an ocean of vulnerabilities doesn't really make sense either. So we're in this together. Thank you, Olaf. And Denise, please. <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Marilyn. And I think, um, uh, yeah, Olaf and Juliana already gave some uh, very good uh, recommendations. So uh, I would like to echo um, them. And um, yeah, maybe to add, um, so climate adaptation is not something for the long term. You should really start today with risk assessment and to take measures. So that's uh, that's also important to, uh, to underline start today. Thank you, Denise. Um, thanks to, I know I'm going to, uh, maybe you are speaking, but we have an IT issue because you were frozen. Sorry, I didn't hear your last sentence. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
now it starts again to freeze. So, okay, thank you. So, uh, thanks to our panelists and the question discussed today, we learned that climate change is creating operational infrastructure, business and safety risk for the air traffic management. Our sector needs to understand them to adapt and build resilience to face increasing risk related to climate change. The effect of climate change will not be identical around the world. There is no single approach to be taken. Many regions will see more precipitation and also more very intense rainfall or flooding, whereas other regions will see a decrease in rainfall causing drought and water restriction. Our last Eurocontrol climate change study provides vital information for the future operation of the European ATM network and concrete data on which to base short to mid-term decision to minimize the potential risk of climate change for both individual organization and the network as a whole. So all airports, but also all aviation stakeholders should carry out a climate change risk assessment of existing and new infrastructure in order to think ahead, reduce risk risk, cost, and ensure future punctuality and regularity in the aviation sector. The experience shared today by our panelists show that adaptation investment can already be done now, so let's do it. Aviation is dependent on all elements of the network to be fully functioning. When an airport is closed somewhere in the world, it will impact the entire network. It makes little sense to have island of resilience in the notion of vul vulnerabilities, as it has been mentioned by Olaf. So to be as resilient as possible, we need to take an integrated approach and coordinate adaptation action at sector and network level. And of course, you will continue to support its stakeholders to face this growing challenge. And finally, I would like to thank our three panelists today for their amazing and great contribution and the viewer, the audience, for the active participation. I hope to see you again in two weeks' time for our next strategic webinar. The next one will be on developing new space for UAM that will be moderated by my colleague Munish. And the other one will be on sustainable aviation fuel that I will moderate myself. So I hope to see you again. Stay safe and see you next time. Thank you.